Firaz Zar, who will tell us about um, medical therapy, NOAC's work. Don't forget about medical therapy. Thanks, Firaz. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Jackie, for, uh, for the opportunity, and thanks for the meeting planning committee for inviting me. So the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation is, uh, is a big problem that we're all dealing with. About 20 million people with atrial fibrillation, almost 2% of the population has it. 80% uh, of those patients have an indication for uh, anticoagulation, and also a, a big proportion of them has concomitant uh, coronary artery disease that is going to require uh, stenting at some point. And this adds to the complexity of the disease that we're dealing with. And this is a uh, uh, this is a data showing pretty much our risk of bleeding tremendously increase as we add to our uh, warfarin therapy, uh, d dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, warfarin plus aspirin, warfarin plus Plavix, and triple therapy has definitely the highest risk of bleeding, almost a 3.7-fold increase in bleeding for those patients. And uh, this is the data from Roxana pretty much showing in the, in, in, in the PCI data that any bleeding is associated with increased mortality. And some of them argue that uh, transfusion will significantly increase your uh, mortality as well. So the, the, this is the, the thing that we fear the most in uh, atrial fibrillation, which is stroke. Unfortunately, most atrial fibrillation associated stroke are catastrophic strokes, and most of them are ischemic strokes. But we always try to balance the risk of bleeding with the risk of ischemic uh, events whenever we counsel our patients about anticoagulation in the setting of uh, atrial fibrillation. So I, I put this slide, and this slide is, uh, is a bit older, but it, uh, it happened when I, was a, when I was a fellow, and only uh, Coumadin was, uh, was, was available for anticoagulation. And if you look at the primary care data, Probably two thirds, you know, from a patient who qualified for anticoagulation, almost two thirds of them were not being anticoagulated with with, with warfarin, which is, uh, you know, the only agent that was available. And uh, and of those who are anticoagulated, only a, you know, 25 or 26 percent have a therapeutic uh, INR. And having this conversation with the patient whenever you want to approach them about anticoagulation was not fun. When they come and tell you, is is that the right poison that you want to give me? So NOAC came along, and you know I don't even know what NOAC stands for anymore. But it is for sure is not a novel anticoagulant because they're not new anymore. But maybe they're a non warfarin, uh, non warfarin oral anticoagulant, or not vitamin K antagonist anticoagulant. And some people call them a DOAC, which is a name that I actually uh, appreciate, a direct uh, oral anticoagulant. But nevertheless, and uh, they are a step closer to the ideal anticoagulant, where we have high efficacy, predictable response, rapid onset, and antidote, and also minimal uh, side effects. So those are the NOACs that are available to us today. And from dabigatran, who is a thrombin inhibitor, to rivaroxaban and the rest of the family of uh, factor 10A inhibitors. And those are some of the uh, characteristics of those uh, uh, medication. And if you notice, the, the, the pharmacodynamics of those medication is, is very much more favorable than the warfarin, especially when it comes to drug-to-drug uh, -to -drug interaction. And this is the timeline of those trials with uh, dabigatran coming first on the market after Rely, followed by rivaroxaban after rocket AF and apixaban after uh, Aristotle and uh, finally doxaban at the end of 2013. And uh, if you look at those trials, uh, almost all of them are very large scale trials. Uh, 15 to 20,000 patients in each of the trials. And as Matt was saying, it's very hard to duplicate uh, those numbers when it comes to device trials. Most of those patients are in their 70s, you know, uh, very good representation in terms of, uh, you know, gender and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Concomitant uh, aspirin use was about 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent, depends on the trial. And they all has CHAD 2 score or, or higher, and you know, to to various uh, extent, and this is a uh, this is a very uh, uh, basic slide that I pulled the data out of those trial. And if you look at uh, if w what I did is I put the odd ratio and I put it in green if it was superior to warfarin, and yellow if it was not inferior, and red if it was inferior. And if you look at the uh, almost all of those uh, NOACs, they have. Uh, similar, if not better, 
profile, whether for ischemic or bleeding complication, uh, compared with Coumadin, maybe with the exception of uh, what Matt was mentioning, uh, uh, GI bleed, uh, specifically in the uh, uh, Dabigatran and Rivaroxaban uh, data. So if you put them all together, this is a meta-analysis published in 2013. You know, you notice that the stroke and ischemic uh, risk are much lower in the NOAC than they were in the warfarin, and so are the major bleeding. And, uh, and probably the, the two dots that cross are primarily for uh, uh, GI bleeds. Uh, one, one other important uh, scenario that we actually deal with very frequently in those patients who get stent is what do we do with the triple antiplatelet therapy? And NOAC, uh, and this is the data from Pioneer, presented a reasonable uh, therapeutic option for people who get uh, PCI where it shows that the risk of bleeding uh, with rivaroxibam and, and uh, clopidogrel is, uh, is, is lower than any other combination at no cost in, uh, in ischemic uh, uh, complications. So they are better. But unfortunately, they are still anticoagulants, and there is an inherited risk of bleeding in, uh, in every anticoagulant that we use. But also, the discontinuation rate in uh, almost all the trials were, were pretty high, and this is mostly at two or, uh, or three years. Uh, Antidote is, is, is a, uh, is a very, was a very important concept for any anticoagulant that we use. It gives us assurances that if there is bleeding of an emergent uh, procedure uh, or overdose, that we have the ability to reverse the medication and, uh, and to, to be safe. There, is, there are multiple antidotes that are either available or uh, developing for uh, NOACs. They were both on uh, 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 the thrombin and the factor 10 inhibitors, and those medication works pretty quickly. Within a within minute of if using the antidote, the level of anticoagulation falls way behind. And this is, this is actually the face of uh, the general cardiologist of the referred docs every time we talk about uh, left atrial occlusion. And uh, just because we are, you know, we're, the concept of intervention for prevention is a novel concept. And if you look at what we have faced in interventional cardiology for that concept, whether it's carotid stenting or PFO closure for stroke, it remains controversial. And uh, this, is, uh, this is data that uh, Matt published and he uh, presented earlier. But if you look at the bleeding event with the watchman compared to, uh, compared to uh, uh, warfarin, it is pretty uh, comparable. And once you take the procedural bleeding, uh, watchman has much better uh, bleeding profile. And this is, unfortunately, there are no data comparing head-to-head -head NOAC with Watchman. But if you look at meta-analysis and an indirect comparison, you will notice that the, you know, there's a trend to improving the overall mortality. And also, the stroke and ischemic embolism are pretty equivalent. And this is a data from our ins own institution, direct, indirect uh, comparison of Watchman with rivaroxumab at the bottom in terms of uh, pre preventing uh, stroke and ischemic complication. And if you notice that there is, uh, they are pretty much equivalent. So uh, in, in bleeding events, there is no access of bleeding events in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in NOAC versus uh, appendage occlusion. This is the same meta-analysis, maybe with the exception of uh, the GI bleed, which is what we talked about in the, primarily in the Pradaxa era. And Matt presented this data, which I think is very important, especially when we talk about procedure for intervention. The risk of complication, if you look at the multiple uh, registries and trials, the risk of complication is, is getting down. It is not down to zero, and I don't know if it will ever be down to zero, but definitely we need to improve our complication profile when we talk about uh, interventions for prevention. And this is uh, the FDA indication for uh, uh, when FDA approved watchmen, it, people who are increased risk of stroke, who are suitable for warfarin, and obviously they, uh, they strongly recommend patient counseling and, and shared decision making when it comes to uh, uh, device therapy. So the way we counsel our patients is, is very simple. If you are in between a, a rock and a hard place, in between ischemic complication and uh, and bleeding. This is when you usually counsel the patient about uh, appendage occluder devices. So in conclusion, most AFib patient to date, unfortunately, remains not anticoagulated. There's growing evidence for NOAC and PCI patients. 
NOAC provide opportunity to minimize growing burden of potentially preventable thromboembolic disease, especially in atrial fibrillation. Reduction in stroke and bleeding will translate into important benefit to our patients, and specific endino will provide reassurances for physicians, hopefully, so they can be more comfortable uh, prescribing those NOACs to a patient who need to be on it. Thank you.